All right, good morning, everybody. Feel free to stand, sing, dance, jump, <laughs> smile. <laughs> do what you do to help praise our God this morning.
Welcome to Sheldon Christian Church. Good to see you all. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to read from the call to worship. This is from 1 Timothy. Um, Train yourselves to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. For this we labor and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all men, and especially for those who believe. Uh, we've got some announcements this week. I especially want to emphasize that there's a, a memorial service for Robin after church today. So please stay and participate in that. Um, couple of, there's a flyer, a double-sided flyer in your bulletin, women's uh, group meets on Wednesday or Thursday with Sherry and then the, the uh, Northwest Christian Women's Conference coming up. Uh, so information there. There's an elders meeting on Tuesday in the office and uh, we want to especially emphasize the, um, the uh, interview committee committees meet together on that day. So please come on uh, if you're part of those committees. Uh, I want to talk about the couple of um, interviewees we've had. So, uh, any other announcements? Any other announcements? Good enough. Let me. Uh, I'm going to pray down the the prayer list on the. If you want to follow along, uh, if you'll join me in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you for the many blessings in our lives, and we thank you for calling us to be your church, calling us to be your people, uh, for being in our presence. Lord, we want to pray for some people out of our group. We want to pray for uh, the next minister to come. We want to prepare him and prepare us. Uh, we want to pray for uh, safe travels for Bruce and Sherry as they come back. I um, want to pray for uh, the Shrive family and Brenda uh, dealing with the passing of Robin. Or we want to pray for Melanie Reed's brother, Roger, uh, dealing with health issues. Uh, same with Carol. We pray for, uh, for healing, uh, for comfort for Gil. Uh, pray for uh, recovery for Linda, just all their living situations, Becca as well. We pray for Jeannie Blen for recovery from surgery for her. Uh, we pray for uh, Ellie and her family. I want to pray for Victoria's sister Belinda, it's dealing with serious health concerns. The same with Jim Larson. Lord, we pray for miracles of healing for them both. Uh, we pray for Carolyn Lecomte's neighbors, Ryan and Rachel. Uh, they're dealing with a, the passing of family member. Lord, we pray for peace in the many parts of the world that are not at peace. Lord, as we meet together, we invite you into our presence. We pray that you are worshipped. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and greet your neighbors.
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart.
Father, because you sent your son, and because he lives, we have hope. We have hope of a future, a future of life with you. We thank you so much for your son and for all that you've done and for the fact that he didn't just go to the cross and he didn't just die and he didn't just die. He rose and he resurrected. And he's raised to life and he sits at your right hand. And because of him, we have that hope of a future. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we praise you, we give you all the glory and the honor and the power and the praise. Through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm not quite as tall as Arnie. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an opportunity and just, I know Rick mentioned the meeting we're having on Tuesday. I would like to put in a plug. We spent 40 days in prayer together. I would like us, if, I, I would I'd appreciate it if you'd be praying for the interview teams. We're going to get together and discuss the candidates that we had and figure out where, where our next step takes us. So please be praying about that, praying for us to, to just do what God wants, follow his lead. So, so for offering, I just found out a few minutes ago Arnie wasn't here. So I'm going to th throw this together. In 2 Corinthians 9-7, it says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So I just ask that you just join me in prayer. Father, we just pause before you and just thank you for all that you do for us. And we thank you that you are our God, that you have given us your son, that you just lead us and direct us. We just look to you. And so, Father, we just now, we're going to take up an offering. We just ask your blessing upon it, that we could use it to further your work here at this place in Mason County. And we just look to you to guide and direct the way that we use these monetary funds. And we just offer these up with a willingness of heart and just look to you for the, for the blessings that you give us, Father. We know that all that we have is a gift from you, and we just look to you continually. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. apologize for not being better prepared. 
<laughs> but um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the ushers if they just come forward. I'm going to pass this out, and I've got a little something I'll share after we receive the envelope. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Let me find it here. Uh, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Jesus came for the specific purpose to live a pure life and to then die for us. He gave his body where he suffered on the cross. He shed his blood to wash us clean.
So the ship leaves. Right. <laughs> the ship horn. The ship horn, yeah. Well, good morning. It's good to be back here. So let's, uh, let me pray for you before we begin, shall we? Father, we just again want to come into your presence with grateful hearts, and just because of the many blessings that you've given to us. Pray today that even as we just look into your word, that you would remind us of how gracious and how good you really are. Pray that as your word goes out today, that you would just meet the needs of each of us that are here. We know that everyone here has been ordained to be here by you, and we all have needs, whether we know that or not. But I pray that even as your word goes out, that uh, you would just possibly change the words from my mouth to their ears, that they would hear exactly what it is that they need here this morning. So we do want to give you thanks for your presence. May we continue to learn how to enjoy that. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. A story was told about a young woman who was working at a cashier in a department store. She had a very cheerful smile, and she had a very interesting name tag. The writer went and looked at it, and he had to look twice because it said, Mary and God. It was M-A-R-Y hyphen N hyphen G-O-D. So the writer asked her, he says, so does that mean that you and the Lord are working this job together? And she said, yes. I want you to know that he works with me, he walks with me, he talks with me, and we have a wonderful time together. She went on to say, I couldn't do this without him because he's the one that has done so much for me. I need to tell people. Mary used her checkout counter as a pulpit. With her smile and her name tag, they were conversation starters. So they could tell people and she could tell people the wonderful things that God had done in her life. Well, this morning I want to look at another Mary who also is going to tell us about some of the things that has happened in her life. So I'd like you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. This is a passage that we normally read around Christmas time, but the lesson here is timeless. Luke chapter 1. In verses 26 to 38, we see that an angel comes to Mary, tells her she's going to have a child by the power of God. And even though she doesn't understand it, her response is, let it be according to your word. She was also told that her relative Elizabeth, who was old and was not supposed to have children, was already six months pregnant. So I want to pick up the reading in verse 39. Luke 1, verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers, and Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. 
As we begin looking at this passage here, it says that at that time, so it was after the angel's announcement that Mary hurried to Elizabeth's house. This was exciting news. She needed to see this for herself. But if you look at a map, Mary was in Nazareth, which is at the north end of Israel, and Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea, which was in the south end. It's believed that Elizabeth and Zechariah, because they were Levites, were actually living in the city of Hebron. Because according to the Old Testament, that was the city that, where the Levites were to live. It was close to 100 miles distance. It would have taken at least three days to travel that distance. And I doubt seriously if she traveled alone. At the first glance of Elizabeth, as Mary entered the house, she recognized the truth of what the angel had said. And I'm sure it deepened the reality of the promise the angel had made to her. And it also seems that Mary's greeting was the trigger that God used to fill Elizabeth with the Holy Spirit, allowing her to prophesy of things that she knew nothing about. We see that she blessed Mary three different times. And the word she used is the word that we get our English word eulogy from. It means to speak well of. It defines a state of happiness, and that's what we do at funerals. We speak well of the dead. Elizabeth said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. And blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. She's saying that this whole event is going to bring Mary great joy. But God never told Elizabeth anything about Mary. The Holy Spirit revealed it to her. She went on to say, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The word she uses for Lord here is the word kurios. It means to whom the person belongs. One who is the possessor and the disposer of human life. The one who has the power to decide life and death issues. So Elizabeth is acknowledging that the one who will be born of Mary is the sovereign who already has power of life and death, and to whom she herself is the servant, and to whom she is accountable to. The verse indicates that from before his conception, he was already Lord. The way the title is used indicates the greatness of Mary's child before his birth. The title Lord here is used by Jesus, or for Jesus, six times in Mark, and 20 times in Luke. And it's by the resurrection, <clears throat> excuse me, that Luke confirms that Jesus is the sovereign God. And in Luke's second letter, he quotes Peter's sermon. In Acts 2.36, he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Christ. And there, there are some religious people here, to, not here, <coughs> hopefully, here <coughs> today who take Elizabeth's comment in verse 43 out of context. Because while ignoring other verses, they claim that Jesus is a created being that came into existence at his birth. And I hope we all realize that this is bad theology. Because in John chapter 1, we're reminded that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in 114, the Word then became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The apostle goes on in his epistle in 1 John to say, and we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son into the world to be the Savior of mankind. There are many other verses that we could use to bury that type of thinking. But when anyone tries to make Jesus Christ a created being, what we do is we, we strip him of all authority and power. He becomes nothing more than a glorified man. I even came across an inmate recently that didn't even believe that Jesus was a real person. Another problem that's developed in the church because of Elizabeth's greeting is about how much emphasis we should put on Mary. 
The church has gone to two extremes. The early church tried to make Mary equal with Jesus himself. And later in history, trying to correct the error, swung the other way and makes hardly any mention of Mary whatsoever. But today, the Catholic Church has now swung back and has even called Mary a co-redeemer. Some Catholic crosses have Jesus on one side and have Mary on the other. See, our concept of Mary needs to be somewhere in the middle. Because up until the time that she delivered Jesus, she was the Virgin Mary. After that, she was no longer a virgin. Matthew 1 tells us, but Joseph had no sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. That means that after Jesus was born, Joseph had sex with his wife. And as soon as you have sex, I'm sorry, you're no longer a virgin. I think we all know that. But more proof is even found in Jesus' own words. When the religious leaders were complaining about Jesus in Matthew 13, they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? See, Mary and Joseph had other kids. Was Mary special? Yes. Was she chosen by God for a special task? Yes. But Jesus downplayed her role and put her on equal footing with all the other disciples. Because the other disciples were also chosen for a special purpose. You look at history and all of them died as martyrs except one. In Matthew 12, 48, we read, Jesus speaking, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. See, did Mary do the will of the Father in heaven? Yes. Was it unique? Most definitely. Was she blessed? Yes. But does it merit us praying to her as some believe and teach? No. Or should we pray to any other apostle or so-called saint? No. Jesus told us how to pray. And what did he say? Our Father, who art in heaven. We're never told to pray to anyone else. In fact, God tells us that anyone or anything that takes the place of God in our life is considered a false god. Another thing that Elizabeth does here is commend Mary for her faith. She said in verse 45, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. I think Elizabeth was making a contrast between Mary, who believed what the angel said, and her husband Zechariah, who didn't believe what the angel said, when he said they were going to have a child. In fact, while Mary was there with Elizabeth and Zechariah, Zechariah was still dumb. He couldn't speak until after his child was born because of his unbelief. Mary's faith is even more incredible when we realize that according to the Old Testament, any single lady who was found pregnant could lead to her stoning. And certainly her fiancé, Joseph, who knew that the child was not his, would hardly go through with the wedding. Yet by faith, Mary was willing to trust God to work all of these things out. And instead of worrying, she wrote a praise song in verses 46 to 55. As you look in your Bible, this section is not written in paragraph form. Anytime you see scripture in this form, it's poetry. And Hebrew poetry is nothing like the poetry in our Western culture. Our poetry deals with rhyme and rhythm. Theirs does not. Eastern poetry is based on what we call parallelism. It's a grouping of thoughts that all work together. They make a theme. The majority of them, like the Psalms, are made up of two or more thoughts. They can be the same, they can be different, or they can develop it as it goes along. As Mary seeks to praise the Lord, she uses numerous Old Testament quotations. 
She indicates that she knows her scriptures and she knows the history of her people. She refers to the great things that God has done. How would she know those things? You know, the Old Testament is full of instances where people are told to erect altars or a pile of stones to commemorate things that God did in the past. And the idea is so when your children or your grandchildren ask you, what's that pile of rocks there for? And you would tell them, this is where God did such and such. She mentions God has done great things. Not only for her, but she includes all of those who fear the Lord. That means that she's praying for us. Because if you fear the Lord, God is going to do great things for you. This indicated that she trusted the Lord for her own salvation because she called God her Savior. In verse 47, look at what she says. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So do you see the parallelism? My soul, my spirit. It glorifies, it rejoices. In the Lord, in God my Savior. She goes on to say, My spirit rejoices in God my Savior because he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. And because of that, what's her response? Holy is his name. See, Mary praised God for what he did for her. She's remembering God's involvement in her life in the past. The hard thing for us is that we know nothing about Mary's past until the angel came to her. But in rehearsing what God has done in the past, she can feel confident for the future. She says in 50, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary is including us in her prayers. And she's quoting from Psalm 103. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. So she's praying for us today, not even knowing that. As she continues, she uses the words, he has. She's showing how aware she is of the history of her people. Look at verse 51. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. But he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. But he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. See, Mary took God's promises to Israel literally and didn't try and explain away like many people do today. As we look at her song, how did Mary understand and view God? In 49, he's done great things. In 49, holy is his name. In verse 50, his mercy extends to those. 51, he's performed mighty deeds. She repeats that. 52, he has lifted up the humble. In 53, he's filled the hungry. See, Mary recognizes that her Lord is one who cares enough for the humble and the hungry and to reach down to meet human needs. Mary knew God as a God of power and a God who's concerned about his people. Now that we know what she knew about God, This would explain Mary's response to the angel when he told her about this impossible thing that was going to happen to her. She replied, may it be to me as you have said. She had a clear vision of who her God is. She had already acknowledged him as the God who cares and cares enough to act and be involved in everyday life. And out of this, there are two basic ideas that I want to leave and I want to focus on. If God should ask something of you that you might consider impossible or out of your comfort zone, 
Do you know the Lord well enough to be able to trust him? Mary based her trust on her previous experiences with God. Even though we don't know what they are, she admits, God has done great things for me. The illustration is a man who lived in northern Michigan went for a walk in a densely forested area. When it began to get dark, he decided it was time to go home. So he was used to hiking in the woods, felt a keen sense of direction, so he didn't bother to look at his compass. After walking for a long time, though, he decided he'd better check in. He was surprised to see that the compass showed he was going west when he should have gone east. He was so sure of his own sense of direction, he figured there had to be something wrong with the compass. He was about to throw it away when a thought came to him. You know, my compass has never lied to me. Maybe I should follow it. So he chose to follow its direction, and he soon found his way out of the woods and back home. (coughs) You and I need to ask ourselves, is there any time that we trusted the Lord that he never really came through for us? It may not be the exact way we ask, but has God been faithful through all of those things? God will never lead us astray. More recently, I want to share that a group of of about 46 pastors got together last month. We went to a prayer summit, and we were given an interesting assignment. They asked us to break down our life into 10-year segments. Some of us, of course, had more segments than others because we're older. (laughs) But from like 0 to 10 to 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and so on. And as much as we could remember, we were asked to write down every encounter or interaction we had with God that made an impact on our life. It's going to happen again. (coughs) It included events that lead to our conversion, insights that may have led to a change in our life, Maybe how God intervened in your career choices. How God answered specific prayer requests. Seeing God's protection in the wake of an accident. And so on. (coughs) Can I get my water? Excuse me a little bit. I know I should have brought it up. (coughs) (coughs) That's what happens when you're in a small church. Sorry about that. But we were asked to put all of those things together. <clears throat> and what we, in reality, what we were asked to do was to count our blessings and to name them one by one. <clears throat> when I was looking through this, there was one event that always stood out for me. As a teenager, when I was young and foolish, and I know it may be hard for you to imagine that I could have done that, but we do, you know. <clears throat> Me and two friends went on a joyride in a Pontiac convertible where there were no seatbelts. Speeding through a country road, we came up over a rise, and the road ended with a 90-degree turn over a wooden bridge over a railroad track. It was a sharp turn in and a sharp turn going out. And a wooden bridge is no match for a 4,000-pound Pontiac. The country song, Jesus Take the Wheel, would have been very appropriate right then, but it hadn't even been written yet. Yet because I don't remember much until I came out the other side. When I stopped the car, we all took a sigh of relief and realized that God had intervened. Like I've said many times before, God's plan for my life took into account my stupidity. And God's plan for your life also takes into account your stupidity. You need to keep that in mind, too. (coughs) We all all three of us realized that God had intervened and saved our life. If God had not been there and done something, that I would not be standing here today. My friend sitting in the middle seat 
would not be a missionary to Austria for the last 40 plus years. And the fellow on the outside would not be a pastor in West Virginia today. Whether that had that type of effect on us, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but the enemy was going to destroy three of God's people that day as stupid kids. So did I include that in my list? You bet I did. That was one of the first things. And the hard part for me was I had to figure out what bracket that fit in. <laughs> I don't remember even the age, you know. So, But, but it was an eye-opening experience to be able to look back and see God's hand in leading me to where I am today. And like the song says, when we count our blessings and name them one by one, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And I want to encourage each of you to do the same exercise. I believe you would be amazed at how God has led you to where you are today. When we realize how great things God has done in the past, we can see how great things God is doing in the present. And that will help us trust his plans for us in the future. The second idea I want to throw out is how well do you know your scriptures? If you wanted to spend some time praising the Lord like Mary did, could you recite passages of Scripture back to the Lord? How many verses do you know? Do you know verses that talk about the glory and the majesty of the Lord? Do you know passages that talk about His love for you? Keep in mind that in Mary's time, they didn't have copies of Scripture that everybody could read. They only read it in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Because they only had a few. They were all hand copied way back then. Imagine how Mary had to pay so much attention in order to memorize that. How many do you know? Can you recall some of the things that God has already done in your life? Do you feel comfortable in knowing that God has taken care of you in the past to guide you and that you can trust him for the future today? Mary knew the God of her people, and she trusted him explicitly. Can you say that of yourself? Can you honestly say that whatever the Lord sends or allows in your life, it comes from a loving, heavenly Father that only wants what's best for you? Do you really believe that? You know, they say that hindsight is twenty twenty. And many times, it is really only when you look back that you can see the hand of the Lord in your life and honestly say, he has really done great things for me. There are times when I try and imagine what my life would be like if I never had Jesus in it. The closest I could come is to remember what some of my schoolmates were like, what they were involved in, the choices they made, and most importantly, the consequences those decisions were made for them. I'm a firm believer that as powerful as God is to save people out of things, he's just as powerful to save people from things. And I can truly say like Mary that God has done wonderful things for me. And I want to encourage you to do the same Again, assignment for your life. Ten-year increments and see the wonderful things God has done for you. There's an old hymn entitled, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And the chorus goes, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, to trust him more. You know, when God is directing your life because of our previous experiences, we should all be able to say like Mary, let it be according to your word. Let me pray for you. <clears throat> Father, <clears throat> we are so thankful for your love for us. 
We are so thankful that you have created works of service for us to do before the foundation of the world. You have ordained the times in which we live and the places in which we live. We need to learn to thank you for what you've done in our life so far. And Lord, maybe not everything that you've allowed has been really pretty. May not be enjoyable. The suffering may be immeasurable. And yet we know that you do not waste pain. The things that you allow are to create a more Christ-like spirit for us. And the outcome is that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. So Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. And I pray that we would all learn to be able to look back and see how you have truly blessed us and done great things. And there is no reason why we should not be able to trust you for the future because you are a faithful and a loving God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever opened your heart to Jesus? This is an opportunity. We have been trying to rearrange things over the last couple years, and maybe we haven't given the attention that we need on an invitation. But if you've never opened your heart to Jesus, would you consider that today? Would you consider opening your heart? Please don't leave here without speaking to someone. If you need prayer, if you need the congregation to pray for you, if you need specific prayer, if, if you need prayer and would like to talk about baptism, or you'd like to talk about pledging membership, I encourage you to speak to one of the elders. I encourage you to, to seek out one of the ministerial community members or our worship team we are here to encourage you. We are here to help you. The elders are here to serve you and to, to help you in your walk. So let's come now while we stand and sing our invitation song.
Dear Lord and Father, we just ask you to be in our hearts, to be in our lives. We trust you. We put you first. We ask you to be with us this week. Help us, Father, as we are dismissed from this time, this this fellowship, that we seek to you, seek you to put you first in our lives, to, to believe in you, to help to share your love to others. Help us, Father, give us opportunities. And when you give us those opportunities to share your word, help us to recognize that. Thank you, Father, for being with us. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you, Father, as we trust you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I also remind you that we do have a memorial service for our brother Robin uh, shortly after our dismissal. Thank you so much.